Yeah. Okay, so can you see it now? Uh, yeah, that's better. Okay, okay. And uh, can you also see my car, sir? Uh, so now we see the title and your name. And if I move the cursor, are you able to see the cursor? Yeah. Okay. Uh, there is some way of making the cursor bigger, but I don't know how to do. Anyway, so you can see. Okay. Uh, so shall I begin? Yes. Okay, so I regret that I am unable to be physically present at this uh, workshop with you all in the beautiful Cambridge. And I thank uh, the organizers uh, for making this arrangement so that I can uh, uh, give this, uh, uh, give, make my presentation online. And I would, uh, first of all, I would, uh, yeah, uh, I would like to dedicate my talk to two stalwarts in our field whom we lost recently and from whom I have received tremendous support and encouragement throughout my career. So Jean Parker was my PhD supervisor at the University of Chicago and got me initiated in, into this field. And Nigel Weiss also had known me from the time of my PhD days and he wrote a wonderful foreword for my popular science book, Nature's Heart Cycle. So uh, to the best of my knowledge, uh, this remains the only popular science book in English which, uh, uh, which presents uh, dynamo theory for, for, for the general readers. And on the first day, uh, Steve Tobias mentioned about the 1992 dynamo workshop at INI. And then he said that uh, in this workshop, uh, dynamo theory is uh, again coming back uh, 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 to INI. So I would like to correct him by pointing out that his own supervisor, Nigel Weiss, uh, arranged uh, sort of a, a, a very scintillating solar dynamo workshop in, I think in nine, 2004, which I happened to attend. So anyway, uh, so, uh, so I'm sure that all of you know that uh, Gene Parker, wrote the fundamental paper on the, on, the, on, on, on the turbulent dynamo in 1955, in which he presented uh, what is now called the alpha omega dynamo model of the solar cycle. So when that work was done, nobody even suspected that uh, there could be a, a large scale flow like the meridional circulation in the sun. So the early papers on solar dynamo did not uh, incorporate this meridional circulation. But over the last half century, we have become aware of uh, different aspects of this meridional circulation. And it is also realized that it plays a very, very important role in the solar dynamo. So my talk will be on this the relation between the solar dynamo and its uh, meridional circulation. So here is the uh, plan of my talk. Uh, first, I shall uh, discuss uh, relevant observational data for the meridional circulation. And then I shall come to the uh, basics of the flux transport dynamo model in which the meridional circulation plays a crucial role. So after discussing how these this, 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 uh, regular periodic features of the cycle are explained, then I shall come to the irregularities of the solar cycle and discuss how uh, this, how it may be possible to model these irregularities. And then I shall uh, come to a discussion of the back reaction of the dyno on the meridional circulation. So initially I was also planning to discuss about the extrapolating this sort of solar dyno model to solar-like stars. But I realized that I would not have enough time for that. And also, Lorraine Juf has uh, discussed this topic to some extent. So maybe I shall leave out uh, this last topic unless there are any questions. OK, so let me first discuss how this nature of this meridional circulation got established. So you all know that uh, sunspots are regions of concentrated magnetic field on the solar surface. So Babcock and ba Babcock in 1955 uh, first discovered that uh, there is a, some weak field on the solar surface outside sunspots. It's uh, strength uh, less than 10 Gauss. 
So later it was realized that it was not actually weak field uh, ex existing over all over the surface, but so, so rather it exists in the form of small flux tubes of typical radius, a few hundred kilometers and field strength, thousand gauss. So in the low resolution magnetograms in uh, this, the, this of earlier times, this uh, flux tubes are not resolved. So it seemed that there is a sort of a weak field on the surface. So for historical reasons, we still often refer to this as a, as a weak field, though now we know that it is a not really a weak field. So from 19, mid 1960s, uh, several observers discovered that on the solar surface, there are some belts of latitude in which this weak field has one particular sign and the progress of the time, this, uh, this, this, this belt shifted poleward. Uh, so one can uh, at a, at at a, uh, one can take a longitude average of this weak field at a particular latitude and a particular time and plot it in the time latitude plot along with the uh, the butterfly diagram of sunspots and if you do that then you get something like this this shaded regions the butterfly diagrams of sunspots and uh, the scholars indicate uh, this uh, longitude average a uh, weak field in this time latitude plot. So we know that with the solar cycle, uh, sunspots appear at lower and lower latitudes. So, so that you can see in this sort of a trend. And on the other hand, there's a weak field outside sunspot that is drifts forward. So you see that this, uh, that the scholars go in the other direction towards the pole. And what causes this uh, poleward migration of this, of this weak field? So the most obvious possibility that there is a plasma flow, which is uh, from the equator to the poles and this plasma flow, this meridional circulation is uh, carrying this, uh, this weak field. And we can easily from such plots, we can easily make the estimate that the strength of this meridional circulation is of the order of uh, 20 meters per second. And certainly we do not expect that the plasma which goes to the poles to be, to be piled up there. So somehow there has to be a return flow underneath the surface for the plasma to come back again to the equatorial regions. And within the last few years, uh, by, using, uh, by using the techniques of helioseismology, uh, different groups have tried to found, find out the nature of this return flow. And uh, this is a kind of uh, difficult observation. So for several years, there was a discrepancy between the uh, results of uh, different helioseismology groups. So here I show some of these results. So red color corresponds to uh, this, uh, this equator ward, uh, so, sorry, pole ward uh, 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 flow, and this blue color corresponds to equator ward flow. So you see that there are discrepancies among these different groups. But I would draw your attention to this plot C uh, from Rajguru and Antia. So they concluded that they found that the, uh, that the return flow takes place uh, here. And what is this region? And I, what is this curve at the bottom? So I suppose all of you know that the sun has a convective envelope surrounding a radiative core. So this, uh, this, this bottom surface, which is uh, at 0.7 solar radius, that is the bottom of the solar convection zone. So they concluded that this return flow takes place at the bottom of the convection zone. And now this result is more or less established by a more exhaustive study by Giza et al, which uh, led to a, a comprehensive paper in science. They, uh, confirm the results of Rajguru and Antia that uh, the return flow of this meridional circulation takes place at the bottom of the solar convection zone. And that makes us uh, dynamo theorists uh, rather happy because that sort of meridional circulation gives the uh, base uh, theoretical results for the dynamo. In fact, we theorists have been proposing for a long time uh, that, uh, that uh, the nature of meridional circulation should be like that. And now it is uh, confirmed uh, by helioseismology. So in this talk, I shall not have time to get into the theory of uh, what causes this meridional circulation. But recently I wrote a rather pedagogical review on this theory. So if you are interested, you can uh, look at it. 
So after discussing these uh, relevant observations of the meridional circulation, I want to come to the flux transport dynamo model. Uh, but uh, before I discuss that model, I want to make some polemical statements. Uh, so I apologize in advance if uh, my statements are going to offend somebody. Uh, but I thought that uh, I should make this statement because I realized that uh, this majority of the participants in this workshop are from the from the from the, uh, the from the planetary dynamo community, and I felt that the uh, very limited discussions of of solar dynamo, which had so far taken place in this workshop, may give a very wrong impression uh, about the current status of the solar dynamo to people uh, who are outside the field. So apart from Lorraine Ju, all the other speakers who touched upon the solar dynamo. Uh, spoke as if uh, there is uh, no such thing uh, as, as the flux transport dynamo model. And if you attend any international conference on solar magnetism, or even if you look at the scientific programs, you would realize that uh, the most many of the talks uh, uh, on, the, on the dynamo would be related to the flux transport dynamo model or would deal with uh, simulations uh, motivated by this uh, flux transport dynamo. And I may also mention that uh, only two days ago, this uh, Chandrasekhar Prize uh, for this year was announced. And uh, this is the given uh, for developing the flux transport dynamo model. So I am not showing uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this prize certificate to advertise myself, but merely to make the point that the community takes the uh, flux transport dynamo model very seriously. And I may mention that in the 2000 Dynamo Workshop at INI, organized by Nigel Weiss, also had several speakers who talked about the flux transport dynamo model, though the model was just emerging at that time. And in fact, uh, that uh, workshop at INI was presumably the, 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 the first important international meeting in uh, where uh, the, this flux transport dynamo was uh, uh, discussed very extensively. Okay, let me now come uh, to, the, to, the, to this flux transport dynamo model. So ever since the beginning of uh, MHD research, it has been realized that uh, differential rotation uh, can stretch out a toroidal field to produce a colloidal field. And within the last few decades, the helioseismology has mapped the, uh, the, the, this uh, differential rotation of the sun. And we know that there's a particularly strong differential rotation at the bottom of the solar convection zone. So we believe that the strong toroidal fields are produced at the bottom of the convection zone. And then uh, parts of these fields may rise uh, due to magnetic buoyancy uh, to come and produce uh, sunspots at the surface. And as this flux tube rises, uh, it, uh, it, uh, the, uh, due to the action of the Coriolis force of the sun, it, it, it picks up a little bit tilt. So when on the surface, when you get a, eventually get a bipolar sunspot, this bipolar sunspot has a kind of a tilt. And uh, this tilt has been observationally known for uh, nearly uh, for about a century and it's called Joy's law, but it's uh, theoretical uh, modeling was first done by uh, De Silva and me. But anyway, this, uh, this, this tilt of this bipolar sunspot, that plays a very important role in the generation of the, of the poloidal field, as uh, pointed out by Babcock and later in the 1960s. So let us consider a tilted uh, bipolar sunspot, uh, 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 bipolar uh, uh, tilted uh, pair of bipolar sunspots, and let us uh, consider the case that the uh, sunspot at the higher latitude has positive polarity. So when these sunspots decay, we expect that more positive polarity uh, magnetic field would be spread out at the higher latitude and more negative polarity uh, 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 magnetic field would be spread out at the lower latitude, and that would give rise to, the, uh, to a poloidal field. So we now believe that the, that the poloidal field of the sun is produced by this babcock layton mechanism. And I'm sure that all of you know about this uh, alpha effect. 
uh, in which the poloid oil field is uh, twisted by the helical turbulence to produce the poloid oil field. But that kind of twisting of the toroid oil field is possible only if the toroid oil field is no, not too strong. And from the simulations of uh, uh, magnetic buoyancy and from other considerations, we now think that the toroidal field of the sun is uh, quite strong and an and alpha effect would be quenched for uh, such strong fields. So, so the, uh, presumably the poloidal field of the sun is produced by the back of later mechanism. So here I show a cartoon of the flux transport dynamo model. So green color indicates here the region at the bottom of the convection zone where differential rotation produces a strong toroidal field. And these red arrows, the uh, red uh, lines with arrows correspond to magnetic bias due to which this toroidal field uh, rises to the surface. And this brownish color near the surface uh, corresponds to the region where this by Babcock later mechanism, uh, this poloidal field generation takes place. And these blue uh, curves, these contours uh, uh, correspond to the all important meridional circulation, which is a uh, uh, which is a uh, polar at the at the at the surface, as we see in surface observations, and it is equatorward at the bottom of the convection zone, as confirmed now by helioseismology. Uh, so the strong toroidal field, which is produced at the bottom of the convection zone, is advected equatorward by this flow, and as a result, uh, the, we we find that sunspots form at lower and lower latitudes with the progress of the cycle. On the other hand, the poloidal field, which is produced near the surface, that is affected onward uh, by, this, uh, by this meridional circulation uh, in accordance with, this, uh, with the observational data. So I may point out that some preliminary ideas were of this uh, type of model was given by Wang, Shili, and Nash by using a simple one-dimensional model. But the first uh, two-dimensional models of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of this kind of flux transport dynamo was constructed by some of us in, uh, in, in mid-1990s. Okay, so these uh, this early calculations were, uh, uh, were based on the uh, mean field model. And here I show the basic mean field equation. So you can write the magnetic field in this fashion. So this B corresponds to the toroidal field and this A is associated with the poloidal field. And we can write the velocity field also in this way. So here is the differential rotation and uh, V is the meridional circulation. And then we get uh, these two coupled uh, partial differential equations, one for the toroidal field and one for so, so this one is for the poloidal field and this one is the toroidal field. So we have to solve these equations together. So in our uh, group, we developed this code Surya for uh, solving these equations. And I show some uh, results uh, obtained by this code. So on the left side, you see this evolution of the toroidal field and on the right side, the evolution of the poloidal field. So you see that the toroidal field is produced at the bottom of the convection zone by the strong uh, differential rotation there. And uh, this, uh, this meridional circulation advects it to the equator. So you expect if uh, sunspots formed for it, uh, they, they would be increasingly formed at uh, lower latitudes. And here meridional, uh, th this poloidal field is produced by the babcock layton mechanism uh, near the surface and then is advected poloid. And from uh, this kind of uh, theoretical calculations, one can try to construct this kind of a theoretical butterfly diagram. So here I show one theoretical butterfly diagram. So these are the butterfly uh, diagrams of the, of the, of the sunspots which are to be compared with this observational butterfly diagrams. And these contours here are the contours of uh, this poloidal field uh, on the solar surface at the, in this time latitude plot. So these contours have to be compared with these colors. So this figure uh, taken from uh, this, our 2004 paper was one of the first serious theoretical efforts to model this observational data. Uh, so I hope we'll all agree that it was, uh, it was, uh, it was a uh, reasonably uh, good uh, theoretical feat. 
So anyway, so this discussion hopefully has given you some idea how one can use the flux transport dynamo to model some of the regular uh, periodic features of the, of, the, of the solar cycle. So now I come to the irregularities of the solar cycle. So you know that the solar cycle is only approximately periodic. There are some cycles which have been very strong and there are some cycles which have been weak. And during the 17th century, there was a period of something like 85 years or so when sunspots were not seen at, at all. At all, This is called the mundane minimum. So the question is uh, what gives rise to this uh, sort of irregularities in the solar cycle? So the earliest idea was that uh, this is a manifestation of a nonlinear chaos. Tell study appears that the most obvious kinds of uh, nonlinearities would not uh, give rise to this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, sustained uh, irregular uh, behavior, but rather uh, this nonlinearity is trying to stabilize the this this uh, uh, this this, uh, this oscillation. So some of us have this idea that uh, that's a more likely candidate for explaining this irregularity is is some stochastic uh, fluctuations present in the dyno process. So what may give rise to such uh, stochastic fluctuations? So we, I, I pointed out that, uh, that, that, that the tilt of uh, sunspot pairs, that uh, bipolar, bipolar sunspot pairs, that plays a very important role in the babcock layton mechanism. And this tilt is, is, is uh, and, and as well, when the flux tube rises through the convection zone, it is buffeted by the turbulence in the convection zone. So as a result, we usually see a scatter uh, in, in, in the tilt angles around the average given by Joyce law. And certainly the scatter in the tilt angle would produce a stochastic fluctuations in the babcock layton process. So Choudhury, Chatterjee, and Jiang identified this as the main source of irregularity in the solar cycle. And based on this idea, they tried to develop a mechanism how to predict a, a future sunspot cycle uh, in the, before its onset. Now this topic of uh, trying to predict a future sunspot cycle based on dyno model, uh, that, uh, uh, that, that became a hot subject around 2006 or 2007. So in this plot on this, uh, uh, on this horizontal axis uh, uh, depicting time, I show this, uh, this, this, this era when this first of these predictions were made. Uh, this first prediction by Dick Bothy and uh, Gilman was that the, uh, that the next cycle would be very strong. So here, the star here uh, indicates the, the this this uh, this uh, this amplitude of uh, this of, of the of the of the cycle according to their prediction. But we felt that uh, some of the assumptions in the model were not correct. So by using this idea that the that the fluctuations in the in the in the uh, babcock layton mechanism, they are the source of the irregularity. We may came up. We were able to come up with a different prediction that the next cycle would be would be somewhat weaker cycles. According to our prediction, the amplitude of the next cycle would be something like this. And eventually, when years went by, we found that the sun almost uh, uh, tried to hit our prediction uh, like a bullseye. So I would say that uh, this is the uh, in the history of the subject. This is the first. Uh, a successful dyno based prediction of a, of, a, of a solar cycle before its onset. And when this work was done, we did not consider any fluctuations in the meridional circulation. But are there fluctuations in the meridional circulation? So we have uh, proper data for, uh, for, for, for direct data for meridional circulation for not more than 20 years or so. Uh, so we have to look for indirect evidence for fluctuations in it. And in this flux transport dyno model, it is uh, found that it's the meridional circulation which says the dynamo period. So the period is uh, very approximately found to be 
uh, to be inversely proportional uh, to, the, to, the, to the amplitude of the meridional circulation, as you see in this particular model, and other models also give uh, similar results. And now we have uh, some data about the about the durations of uh, of, of, uh, of various uh, solar cycles starting from 18th century. So here is a plot of uh, durations of uh, various solar cycles, and you can see that uh, that 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 uh, that cycles so 10 to 14 had a somewhat uh, longer duration than 11 years. So presumably it was the, uh, the meridional circulation was slower there, which lengthened this, uh, this, this, this period. And then for cycles 15 to 19, we see that uh, their durations were somewhat shorter than 11 years. So presumably the meridional circulation was faster, which uh, made the cycles shorter. So based on such considerations, we can conclude that uh, there have been uh, stochastic fluctuations in the meridional circulation uh, in the past. Uh, so presumably with a coherence time uh, somewhere in the range between uh, 10 years and 50 years, maybe 30, 40 years. So, so far we have no theoretical clue what uh, gives rise to this meridional circulation, but these observ observations uh, seem to indicate this. And now if there are such uh, uh, random fluctuations in the meridional circulation, how would that affect the dynamo? So uh, as we have pointed out that the solar meridional, if, if suppose some at some time the meridional circulation has slowed down, so that will make the cycles longer. And if cycles are longer, then uh, there will be more time for diffusion to act. And as a result, that will try to make cycles weaker. So our prediction is that the, that, the, that the longer cycles should tend to become weaker and the opposite is that shorter cycles should, should become stronger. So is there any observational evidence for that? Now it turns out that uh, there are lots of irregularities in the solar cycles in the 19th century. So here I show a plot of solar cycles in the 19th century. And you really see that the that the that the shorter uh, that the that the that the that the shorter cycles like this were stronger, and on the other hand, longer cycles like this uh, they were weaker. So certainly, this is in conformity with our theoretical ideas. And if a stronger cycle is uh, shorter, then we also expect that the stronger cycle to rise faster. And, 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 and this effect that the stronger cycles uh, have, 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 have shorter rise time, uh, that has been known for a while and is known as the Waldmeier effect. So here you, I show you a, a, a plot of this observational data of the Waldmeier effect uh, that, that, that rise time versus the strength of the cycle. And you clearly see an anti-correlation and, and then, Garok and I, we carried out a simulation of our dyno model introducing this sort of a fluctuation of meridional circulation with a coherence time of uh, about 30 years. And we are able to get uh, this kind of anti-correlation. So explaining, giving the first theoretical explanation of this Waldmeier effect. And I would say that so far, nobody has been able to find, find out any other way of explaining Waldmeier effect without invoking these fluctuations in meridional circulation. So the successful explanation of uh, Waldmeier effect makes us think that, uh, that, that there are really uh, such stochastic fluctuations in the meridional circulation, which affect the dynamo. Now I come to the question, how we can make a, a model of the grand minima? Uh, so in the last few years, it has been possible to analyze polar ice core data and from which uh, draw conclusions about the nature of uh, solar cycle activity in the past a few thousand years. So I don't have time to get into the details of how that is done, but I would merely quote the result of Usoskin et al, who found that uh, there were something like 27 grand minima in last 11,000 years. So the Monday minimum was not something unique. So how can we explain this uh, grand minimum? So from our simulations, we found that if the 
Olarfil gamma is weak at the beginning of a cycle uh, due to stuff, uh, fluctuations in the Babcock later mechanism. That can push the dynamo into a grand minimum. And the other, on the other hand, if Mediduna circulation V0 is too weak, that also may push the, the, the dynamo into a grand minimum. So from our simulations, we found that if you make a plot of this polar field gamma and this meridional circulation amplitude V0, then the, if uh, these uh, parameters lie in this region or this parameter space, uh, then the uh, dynamo is driven into the grand minimum, but not otherwise. So what is the probability that these parameters lie in this region of the parameter space? Now we can draw, make some inferences about gamma and V0 from indirect evidence for the last 28 cycles. And here is the histogram of that of a V0 and gamma. And since we have a state set of only, I think, uh, 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 28 uh, of, uh, uh, entities, so you cannot expect the the, the 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 probability distribution to be to be to be to be statistically very significant, but still I would say that there is an indication that this probability distribution is probably Gaussian. So we assume that uh, this uh, gamma and V zero have this kind of a double Gaussian probability distribution, and by using this kind of a double Gaussian probability distribution of uh, of of uh, these quantities, we made a a run, we made several runs of our, of our flux transport dynamo code. And here are the results of one run. So in this one run, I show where these uh, grand minima are found and these heights uh, here indicate the durations of their grand minima. And in our various runs, we found that in uh, 11,000 years, we were getting something in the range of uh, between 24 and uh, 30 grand minima which compares very well with this observational data of uh, 27 grand minimum. In fact, we ourselves were rather surprised that, uh, that, that our uh, uh, theoretical calculations gave uh, such a good fit to the observations because we, we knew that there are many uncertainties in our theoretical model. And as I pointed out that in our earlier prediction of uh, Choudhury Chatterjee Jiang, we did not include uh, fluctuations in meridional circulations. But now we know that uh, that is also important. So should we include that uh, in, in, in the predictions of future cycle? Uh, so ha Gopal Hajra and I looked at this problem. So we can consider this quantity P, polar flux at the end of the previous cycle, which is indicated of the fluctuations in babcock layton process. And then there is another quantity R, decade of the previous cycle, which is an indicative of, 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 of what was the strength of meridional circulation at that time. So looking at the data of the last few cycles, we found that uh, there is uh, some correlation of, of, of the strength of the next cycle, both with this, uh, this uh, decade R and also this polar flux P. But instead of uh, considering correlations with R or P, if we consider su such combinations like square root PR or P into R, then we found that the correlation became much stronger. So our suggestion is that uh, now when we do uh, predictions for the future cycles, we should use some combination of P and R uh, to get the sort of a base kinds of prediction. So before I end the discussion of this topic, I may mention that uh, two of our papers dealing with the subject of irregularities of the solar cycle were selected as editor suggestion in uh, physical review later. So the symbols here, uh, they indicate uh, uh, editor suggestion. Uh, this first paper dealt with this prediction of a solar cycle and the next paper dealt with this, with this modeling, this grand minima. Uh, so as you may know, that it is uh, rather rare for a group to get uh, two papers selected as editor suggestion in PRL in a span of uh, six years. So you are really lucky. And this also indicates that, uh, that, the, that the physics community at large uh, finds this topic interesting. And let me now come to the last topic, whether there's a back reaction of the dynamo on the, on the meridional circulation. Uh, so for that, we have to look for uh, uh, observational indication whether there is a 
a variation of meridional circulation in the solar cycle, and such variations have been indeed found in the last few years. So here I show a plot from Hathaway and Reitma. So the red color plot here is the sunspot number, and above it we see a plot of uh, this, uh, this uh, strength of meridional circulation on the surface at the mid latitudes. So you can clearly see that the meridional circulation was weaker at the time of uh, sunspot maxima. So how can we model it theoretically? So at the time of uh, sunspot maximum, we expect that there, is a, there would be a strong toroidal field uh, at the bottom of the solar convection zone, and a strong toroidal field would give rise to a tension force in this direction. And this meridional circulation is, is, in, the, in, in, is in the equatorward direction, so this tension force here would, be, would oppose this meridional circulation, we, and we expect that is meridional circ in that way the meridional circulation will become weaker at the time of the sunspot maximum. So how can we model that uh, theoretically? Uh, so with uh, Gopal Hajra and I developed a perturbative approach in which we split the velocity field and uh, and the, and the vorticity in a sort of unpartered part, which would be they are in the absence of that back reaction, and then uh, there is a partered part v1 omega one, which will be caused by the back reaction of the dynamo generated magnetic field. And we were able to derive uh, this uh, particular equation for this omega one, where this FL is the Lorentz force of the dynamo generated magnetic field, which is given by this expression. So you have to solve this equation along with the dynamo equation, which will give you the magnetic field. And by solving this problem in this manner, we were able to get uh, get get uh, this kind of a theoretical plot. So again, you see that this red color gives the sunspot number, and this uh, uh, black color is the sort of meridional circulation on the surface at mid latitude, which we found from our theoretical model. So you have to compare this with the observational data, and you see that in the observational data. There is a no phase difference between the, 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 this dip in the meridional circulation and the peak of the sunspot number. Whereas we find that there is a small, uh, uh, in our theoretical model, there is a small phase difference, which we were not able to, uh, to, 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 to make disappear. So anyway, so our model gives a sort of a, a correct trend of uh, this observational data. And I may mention that uh, this uh, theoretical model that was the main part of the PhD thesis of uh, my student Gopal Hajda, uh, who was uh, who received the PhD at large price given by International Astronomical Union, which essentially means that IAU adjudged his thesis to be well the world's best thesis in astrophysics in the year 2018. So anyway, I, uh, I am more nearly at the end of my talk. So before I put up my concluding slide, I decided to put one slide uh, in which I address a question which I am often asked. So I may point out that all the results which I have presented in this, in my, in this talk, they are all based on mean field model. So that is the kind of model with which I have worked for many years. And in the last few years, I am often asked this question that maybe this mean field model that was uh, very historically very important, but uh, is it still relevant when uh, it's possible to do a very large uh, numerical uh, simulations like what is being done uh, in the geodynamo community? So I would say that the aim of the solar dynamo DNS is uh, rather ambitious to simulate uh, differential rotation, meridional circulation, and solar cycle simultaneously along with uh, multi-scale convection. So it involves a range of uh, length scales from, from very small flux tubes to, to structures comparable to the size of the sun. And you also have a wide variation of uh, time scales. So I would say that uh, this uh, simulation is, is, is order of one, at least one order of magnitude more challenging than uh, geodynamo simulation. So first, uh, some impressive progress was made in this sort of a solar dynamo DNS around 2010, 
which was uh, about 15 years later uh, than the uh, famous Glassman Roberts uh, simulation of the geodynamo. And even now, the most of the results uh, which have come from solar dynamo simulation are, 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 are more or less uh, suggestive and, and indicative, but they, are, they still have not reached the level where we can, uh, com we can uh, compare them in detail with the observational data. So here I show this, uh, this magnetic field structure obtained by uh, one of this, uh, one of such, uh, uh, such simulations. Now, what are the strengths of the mean field model? So we have uh, lots of observational data from helioseismology and other considerations about these large scale flows of differential rotation and meridional circulation. So in the usual mean field dynamo model, we do not try to calculate uh, these large scale flows, but we use the data obtained from uh, helioseismology and other uh, sources. And by using this kind of uh, observational data, feeding this kind of observational data in our model and calculating only for the magnetic field, we are able to uh, produce uh, some fairly realistic fits with observations, which I, some of which I presented. And that is uh, still uh, this, uh, no, not possible at all from DNAs. So the ultimate aim of this field may be that uh, to, to replace this mean field models with DNS, but it is unlikely to happen that in very near future. So I would say that the mean field model will remain relevant and, 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 and will be useful for at least a few more years to come. So here I put my concluding remarks, but rather than reading out the uh, concluding remarks again, I perhaps I should, I, I should better leave this uh, concluding remarks uh, before you people so that you can uh, take a look at them. And if you have any, 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 any questions, then I shall uh, try to answer. So thank you. Uh, we are entering tea time, but if there are a couple of quick questions, we will try and do that. Uh, yes, from David. Um, you should identify yourself when you ask the question. Okay, hi, Arnab. It's uh, David Hughes. Um, you put forward very strongly the case for flux transport dynamos it's possibly worth just pointing out not everyone might agree with everything you said um the flux transport dynamo is a weird beast right because it couples the surface to the tachycline and forgets the convection zone and the meridional flow is very small compared to the turbulent flow that is in between yeah so it sticks on this conveyor belt remarkably whilst being buffeted by high-speed convection, which apparently does nothing to it, which is a bit of a physical problem. Um, I mean, Babcock Leighton was, was when everything was at the surface, and now it's, now it's Babcock Leighton coupled with the, with the tachycline, and let's forget the convection zone. So that's, I would say, a problem. Uh, and mean field yeah. models, you can predict, you can, you can model almost anything with a mean field model. This has to be recognized. There are a lot of parameters and you've got them at your disposal, and it's possible to model the sun, the earth, Jupiter, you name it, in a mean field model, you can do a really good job of modeling anything. Well, you don't, uh, but you don't pick up the physics necessarily. So, that, so there are problems. I, I mean, you're pushing it as the answer to the solar dynamo problem. It is not the answer to the solar dynamo problem, in my view. Well, uh, I would partially agree with you. I would say that it may not be the final answer. Maybe the for the final answer, maybe one will have to do a more realistic DNS, but uh, maybe it will take at least one decade uh, before uh, that is done. And I do not agree with you that we completely neglect the convection zone because in the convection zone, we, 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 uh, this main effect is a turbulent diffusion. 
and that we include as a parameter. And of course, there are some uncertainties the value of this of this of this of this uh, of this uh, turbulent diffusion. But I also do not agree that we we uh, we can uh, model anything with 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 uh, with with this kind of a flux transport dyno model. No, no, uh, no. It's true that we, by varying the parameters, we can get somewhat different result, but observations put us some serious constraint and it's certainly not uh, uh, true that we can, uh, we can explain anything. And though I am not an expert on DNS, but I would, uh, as far as I know, the DNS also usually it's not, uh, not that you, Put from the first principles, you put the equations that you find in your MHG textbooks, and then everything follows from that. In DNS, also how you treat, I think, uh, I think subgrid uh, uh, modeling and things like that. Uh, there are uncertainties. So of course, I agree that uh, they, 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 this, this uncertainties are more uh, in this flux transport dynamo, in this mean field models. And, 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 and I know that, uh, and, 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 and we do not understand well why this mean field models work. I think the, uh, ideally with the, the fluctuations around the mean should be small, but we know that here the fluctuations around the mean are not small, so we do not have a good justification. But in physics, we, often we have uh, theories which are, even in, uh, in particle physics, we have theories that but sometimes the perturbation series does not converge properly, but we still get fantastic results which match with observational data. So I would say that we probably, uh, we, we, we still have not been able to give a very rigorous justification of the mean field model, but that somehow, I think, uh, captures the, 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 the physics of the problem. And I had several discussions with Nigel Weiss, and I can say that he was also somewhat skeptical about that, but he also agreed that the mean field model captures the, 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 this, this basic physics at some level. So. Yeah, so the mean field, the mean field model can produce and produce the ob the magnetic field of any object you want it to if you've got enough freedom in alpha, omega, beta, meridian of circulation. You can reproduce what you want it to, and that's the, that's the no. Danger. Certainly, I think with these models, we cannot uh, reproduce uh, uh, this 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 anything we want. For example, one thing I discussed was that uh, that 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 this Waldmeier effect, and there are. Uh, Previous efforts to uh, to 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 produce a Waldmeier effect, and I think Dick Potty and Gilman, and they were unable to 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 uh, to reproduce this Waldmeier effect. And we realized that if you use a, a different sort of a value of the of the of the turbulent diffusion, then only you are able to reproduce this Waldmeier effect. So by comparing with this observational data, we we are able to put some tight constraints on these uh, various parameters in this mean field model. Okay, that was a long question and answer. Let's thank Anad and uh, we will convene again in about half an hour with a general discussion. You will have noticed that there are questions attached to the board here some very interesting ones. And if you haven't yet attached a question, uh, feel free to do so. And we'll be together again in about half an hour. Okay, thank you. Thank you.